Hello and welcome to today's Tiger webinar. I'm Lydia Palmer from RIT's Division of Development and Alumni Relations and I'm your moderator for today's webinar. We're happy to have you all join us today and we hope that you and our entire Tiger family are well and continue to weather this new working environment to the best of your ability. We want you to know that the RIT Office of Alumni Relations is available to help all RIT alumni with a variety of needs including new virtual content, learning opportunities, and networking and career assistance as our workplaces and our world work through the new normal of pandemic realities. We especially encourage everyone to connect to the RIT Alumni Association social media channels, including Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, where you will find up-to-date communications and opportunities to connect with other alumni in your region and your industry. Those links are found in the chat box, and the chat box can be opened by clicking on the chat tab at the right of your webinar window. Many in our RIT family have asked how they can help our students in the university as we respond to the pandemic, and we are incredibly grateful for those offers. There are two important ways you can help. First, our new graduates and current students are seeking positions for full-time careers and co-ops, and of course, many of these positions have been delayed or canceled entirely. If your company is hiring or would consider adding a co-op post, please contact Chris Steeler at RIT's Career Services Office and allow her to post that position in our systems. In addition, there is now an unprecedented need for financial aid scholarships for current and incoming Tiger students. If you are able, please make a gift to the link in the chat box and we thank you so much. We want to ensure that everyone is ready and familiar with the presentation tools. If you are joining from a remote location and are currently signed into your company's VPN, we encourage you to close that channel during the webinar to increase the quality of the transmission. The webinar platform is secure without VPN. All attendees have joined in mute mode. However, your questions can be entered in the chat box at any time throughout the discussion. We'll make every effort to address all your comments and questions. You are joining the event using broadcast audio. If you wish to dial in by phone, dial-in information is provided in the chat box. Live captioning is also being provided, and you can find the link to access that in the chat box as well. This webinar will be recorded and made available, complete with captions, in approximately one week following today's event. All participants will receive an email with the link to the recording. If you have any technical questions, please feel free to type those into the chat box as well, and we will do our best to get you the appropriate answers. And now on to our webinar. We are pleased to welcome alumnus and entrepreneur Darren Mass to discuss how great businesses come from tough times. A native of New York, Darren holds his BS in telecommunications engineering from RIT's College of Engineering Technology. He started his early career serving in the Network Operations Center at Paytech Holding and later was promoted to senior leadership of the company. In 2008, he left Paytech Holding and founded Mass Communications, a New York-based company that provides telecommunications and connectivity management services. He served as the CEO of the company for more than 10 years until it was acquired by Windstream Holdings in 2018 in an all-cash transaction for more than $35 million. He founded a consulting business, D.Mass, which specializes in improving business health by treating, I'm sorry, specializes in improving business health by treating operational, marketing, sales, and financial disorders, and is currently exploring a startup focused on the esports industry. Darren is joined by Dr. Richard DiMartino, director of RIT's Simone Center for Student Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Richard holds the Albert J. Simone Endowed Chair for Innovation and Entrepreneurship and is a professor in the Department of Management, International Business, and Entrepreneurship in the Saunders College of Business. In his capacity at the Simone Center, he works to develop diver diverse and inclusive experiential and multidisciplinary innovation and entrepreneurship activities. His innovations include collaborative efforts founding and administering the Saunders College of Business Accelerator Program, formerly known as the Summer Startup Program, and the Technology Commercialization Clinic, the Small Business Strategic Growth Program, and the Digital Entrepreneurship Program. Together, these two gentlemen are well positioned to share their thoughts on how tough times may be the right time to dive into an entrepreneurial venture. Darren and Richard, our audience is all yours. 
Opportunity. That is the word of the day. And, uh, and I want to thank RIT for hosting this. And I want to thank Richard as well for, uh, for being on here with me. The, the times that we're in right now release an amazing opportunity. Uh, and I think this is such an appropriate conversation and topic for today that great businesses really do come from tough or the toughest of times. Um, when we look back in history uh, at some of the mega companies that are out there, they really did come from recessions and depressions and, and downturns and even wars or pandemics. And, and uh, there's, there's not much different today with the world that we live in, what we're now calling our new normal, than there wasn't any other tough time. With my experience, I started out a company that, that we ended up having a nice exit with in 2008. 2008 was one of the worst times. I believe we called that the Great Recession, right? Um, I don't know if we're in a recession yet, but I think we're certainly heading towards a recession. Uh, all the signs are there, but I can't think of a better time to start a company uh, and, and grow a business if you truly have passion and drive. Um, I'll start off with a list of the companies so we have some background that started off in tough times. And, and hopefully that will spark some interest in, in realization that we really did begin these major companies um, in, in, in times of strife and turmoil. Um, What's that? 2009, Venmo. 2009, Groupon. 2008, although arguably, I'm not sure how they're doing today. Uh, Instagram, 2010, Uber, 2009, Pinterest, 2010, Facebook. Uh, really 2004, but they didn't get their momentum until they left the collegiate world uh, in 2008. Uh, Airbnb, 08, Slack, 09, Square, 09. Um, and then if you go way back, you have General Electric. They've been around for quite a while. That was uh, 1982. Uh, I'm sorry, 1892. Uh, General Motors, 1908. IBM, 1911. Disney, Disney, 1929. And the list keeps going all the way to your Salesforce's and Google's and Microsoft and even Apple. So if you look at the history of those organizations, the economy wasn't good at all for them to start off. And what it really leads you to realize, just like I saw in 2008, when everyone thought I was absolutely nuts for starting a business, my grandparents, my parents, uh, my friends, my boss at the time, all said, why would you start a business in a horrible economy? And the reason is very simple. The why is because I'm starting at zero. Everyone else is racing toward me. So if you really think about that, that allows you, if you have the right passion and drive, to start racing towards the top. It opens up so many opportunities for the small entrepreneur that has a great idea to be part of the level playing field, to be able to get the, the opportunity to kind of race with the bulldogs and, and run with the big guys. I, my career was in telecommunications and if you know telecom, there's some major monster companies. And in 2008, there were a lot more major monster companies that are no longer around either by acquisition or, or bankruptcy and, and uh, they just disappeared. When we started out, I was the chief cook and bottle washer with two awesome partners. We had no income, we had no customers, but what we had is zero. There was only one way to go, up. And the fact that we were anybody willing to have a conversation with the big guys on how we can grow and do business with them, they were willing to have the conversation with us. We were, we were able to negotiate deals that would have been unheard of in a normal economy. I was able to get the biggest companies, AT&T, Verizon, to even have that conversation with me because they were just looking for sales or growth. Their wheels were spinning. They were trying not to go backwards. So to even get a contract to do work with or become a customer of major companies, right? We needed to have a really challenging moment. And in 2008, the challenging moment was everywhere around us. Well, fast forward 12 years later, here we are again. I've now ventured into eSports. I'm the CEO for a, a licensing uh, of imaging company called eSPAT, E-S-P-A-T. Um, we're starting off, right? We're starting off in a world where we're all locked inside of our homes, right? Um, you know, luckily I was able to get a haircut, but, but finally, right, we're starting to emerge. But if you look at the eSports industry, 
it's such a great industry because everyone else is locked in their homes and there's opportunity to play video games and be competitive and have an interesting hobby, but there's no live events occurring. So for, for me and Eastbat, the opportunity really is for us to perfect our business model as a pause, only to grow from the ground up, doing it at the right pace without having to compete or allow other competitors to come in and compete with us. So the pause that is the fact we're locked inside in a bad economy is allowing us to start to walk and then run. So, uh, Richard. I, I wanted to add just a, a kind of go on a more macro level and talk about this. What we're really looking at here is we're looking at risk, entrepreneurship under extreme conditions of uncertainty and risk. And where do you find the best returns? Oftentimes in uncertainty and risk. And I don't know how you would classify the, the, the COVID-19 period. We're not in we're not in a recession yet because technically recession has to go to the two quarters. And we, I'm, I'm certain we will be in one, or at least I'm very confident we're going to be in one, not that I want us to be. But what we're seeing here is an environment that we've never seen before. We were just talking about it before. Imagine 9-11 um, and all of the, the fears and all of the questions that came. Imagine that happening in almost every major country and people sitting down and saying, what's going on? Our world has changed. And that's, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing um, people stop and say, is our, our, the way we conduct our business, is the way we conduct our life and the businesses that serve them going to be different? So under this uncertainty, there's all sorts of opportunities that are coming up. Now the business dynamics are gonna be a little bit different, but think about 9-11 um, and think about what people were thinking about and the opportunities that this one event, this black swan, um, might be actually pushing forward, where we're looking at community resiliency, we're looking at security, we're looking at uh, shifts and trades of now having to look at these massive flows of trade that are going over, and how do you look in each container for something bad, all right? Th there was just so many opportunities and many businesses sprung up from that. And I think what you're seeing now, and Darren did a great job talking about gaming. Um, what is this? What is the relationship to schooling? What is the relationship to service from home? What is the long-term enduring? Um, what is the long-term enduring impact of this? Of people learning they can work from home fairly easily, or they can't. Does this mean they're going to be just number a number of services and number of softwares? There are going to be things here. We don't know, but that's where the profit comes from because there's risk. And when you bet on risk, there's return. One last thing I wanna say, and then we're gonna open this up for questions. What typically happens in the support services for entrepreneurs when you go into recession or when there's uncertainty? First of all, you have a lot more people that are interested in creating jobs. So you have more nascent entrepreneurs, people that are starting but aren't really ge generating revenue. The other thing you have is you see the big substantial funders. Many are still there, but as a percentage of the whole, they become more risk averse. That means that big money tends to say, I'm not going to fund really risky startups. I'm going to wait till you have revenue and I'm going to de-risk myself by not putting money into something that doesn't have revenue yet. I'm, gonna, I'm only going to invest in you once you demonstrate there's something there. All right. Um, so you're going to see that. Um, you're going to see people take more chances. And this is what Darren, this is what I, this is a real example. You'll see companies under threat and maybe they'll reject any entrepreneurial idea, but maybe they'll see an entrepreneur, uh, an entrepreneurial idea that they normally would take 24 months to vet. Maybe they'll do it in three months and take that risk. Right? It depends on the nature of the company. But there's a different dynamic now in the environment, and there's lots of opportunities. Let's go ahead and, and uh, Lydia, you're lo looking at some of the questions. Can you, uh, can you throw some of those out there? Sorry about that. I had to get back into the stage. 
Okay, so our first question is up um, from Mark. He says, I'm an intern for a telecommunications company that is a startup. I'm nervous that I shouldn't work here anymore for a few reasons. The economy isn't that great, plus our CIO is kind of a jerk. <laughs> Should I be looking? It's, it wasn't your company, right, Darren? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Should I be looking to work at a more established company? So I, I, you're, I think this plays into your risk question. Is this where we want to go, or, or do, you, do you launch into something new? So I would... Uh... I would say that uh, that CIO is absolutely a jerk. Um, I tried to fire him numerous times, and this is what I get for inviting some of my former friends and colleagues onto a webinar. So, um, but, uh, but no, I think if you do have a job and it's a good job, especially working for an awesome telecommunications company, you should stay put where you are because, uh, because the risk of leaving a career that's uh, working for you and paying is not worth jumping ship just because you can't get along with a CIO that uh, doesn't doesn't uh, act cool. So. so so here's an interesting question, and it's one because I actually was, used to work in telecommunications, so I, I've had some experience in that as well. When you're looking at uh, industries such as telecom, there is there may be opportunity to start a new business, but there's also so much convergence going on in that space. Do you start with the big view and say, we're going to offer all sorts of services to everybody? Or do you try to boutique it and say, I'm working in this one channel and I'm going to try and hook up with the people that do something else? So this is, there's a lot of business cliches that are out there um, and everybody who writes a business book kind of regurgitates the same th thinking and theories, but realistically, they're all kind of true in a sense. For me, in my experience, the best businesses are the ones that stay in their lane. They focus on the one thing that they do better than anyone else and they build upon it. If you constantly say yes to everybody and take on every product, you can be the master of none. And it, it's, it's kind of hard for your clients to understand what your key focus is and what your value is. For, for our telecom uh, company, we focused on customer service and engineering. Those were our big things. Those allowed us to kind of dictate the fact that we weren't the cheapest, but we were the best service provider. And our customers knew exactly what we were. If you asked our customers, they had the brand awareness that we were the best customer service organization we were the best engineering firm. We're a telecom company, but we didn't offer everything. If a client asked us to fix their refrigerator, a lot of companies would have said, sure, we'll fix your refrigerator. Not us, we can't do that. And I think if you deviate too much from your core value, your core product set, you'll then water down the brand and you'll be convoluted and you'll you know, be 10 years later fixing one tiny little thing which becomes a distraction and it's almost a stop and pivot. So you really do need to stay in your lane and, and do one thing better than anyone else. And it's a good recipe for success. And time and time again, you'll see that, you know, most brands that are mega today, they do the one thing that they do better than anyone else. And that's it. I, I couldn't uh, I couldn't agree more with that. Anyone that's starting up has limited resources um, and they need to have a bit of a bench, a beachhead market, excuse me, and they need to work from there. There'll be time for expansion um, when the company gets older and bigger, depending on the robustness of its core market. But if they start off doing many things, then they're not going to be successful because they're not going to be good at anything, I don't think. Yeah. Many companies will just continuously say yes because a customer asked and they'll see uh, a product set that, that they, you know, they, they're chasing the dollar, the revenue. And I think that's, that's a huge mistake. When you start a business, you really should start a business because you have a passion and a drive to do something better than, than mm -hmm. your com competition. If you're starting a business for revenue or profit purposes only or get rich quick scheme, you know, the, the odds are against you. Most businesses fail. Most small businesses inside of five years will not make it, right? The ones that do make it, there's a lot of luck in timing, right? There's a lot of, of good fortune in timing. Uh, but most of those businesses that make it have the passion and the drive and, and the wherewithal to survive and push past tough economic crime uh, times. So. so is there, do you see that, uh, oh wait, I'm sorry. I, um, people you don't want to talk to, give them an idea and they will tell you all the reasons that it can't work. That's, that's a, a view from 
one of our audience people, and I think that's probably <laughs> probably true. Um, do you do you feel that there is still opportunity to be found in doing something better that someone else is doing, or is it all is it always about finding that new product, that new service that someone hasn't thought of yet? Uh, it's a little of both. So obviously, if if you have an invention that's better. Uh, then, then, or it hasn't been invented yet, and you can really push that brand and build that unique, then yeah, then you have a good chance of, uh, of growing and surviving. There's obviously many factors weighing against you because you know, it's, it's hard to be the first. The first has to prove the market, prove the industry, and, and then promote it and, and defy human nature. And you have to try to train people to use your products. Uh, more often than not, the successful brands you see are improvements upon something that already exists. You know, a long, long, long time ago, you know, our caveman ancestors used to use sticks to brush their teeth because they figured they, they needed to do that. Uh, and then one day someone said, hmm, this pig that's running around, I like their bristles. Let me try to rub that against my teeth. Right? That person ended up having a breakthrough. And then fast forward from there, we obviously buy to you know, a toothbrush every hopefully three months or sooner, you replace your toothbrush. That industry boomed because it was an improvement upon an improvement upon an improvement. Um, you know, most of the businesses today, I think, are just reiterations or improvements or reinventions um, with some exceptions. But if you even go back and look at Apple when they came up with the iPhone, it was an improvement upon the smartphone or the palms or, or the inventions prior. They started out with the Apple Newton. Um, I'm sure a lot of people don't remember that. I had one. I traded the guitar for an Apple Newton. Um, I threw that Apple Newton against the wall because it didn't work. And that was Steve Jobs. That was his biggest downfall was the Apple Newton. That was the, was the beginning of the iPhone. Yeah. That, that was, was the beginning of the iPhone. Yeah, I yeah. wanted those too. But they failed oh, and they, they had awful. to. So it just proves the point that if you're the early adopter, the inventor of especially something in technology, the learning curve to teach your audience that this clunky device that use this this spelling and uh, type to text uh, version called graffiti that never worked, right? That that was teaching the market a new behavior, and it was overpriced because you couldn't make these things cheap enough. Of course, it was going to fail. Fast forward 15 years later, we have the Palm devices, and then eventually the Blackberries or the Rim Blackberries. And now we obviously have the iPhone. If it wasn't for the Newton, most likely the iPhone wouldn't have been ushered in. Yeah. But, but to the point of if you really do have an idea and you want to go through the pain of teaching or reteaching human behavior, then you could be successful, but the odds are against you, at least in that sense. You know, what we, what we typically look at, um, Lydia, when we, we, we trying to find a need for a company, for a startup, they, they start off with an idea called a value proposition. And all the value proposition is, is what's someone's problem? And for the amount of money you're going to charge them, do you serve it better for a certain group of people than other folks? So whether it's a, it's a, it's a new device that solves a problem through technology or cleverness, or it's better service, generally it's a combination of both. So the real question is, is how are you solving that problem better than other folks are providing a service that hasn't been produced yet um, where there's a demand? It, it's not so much do you have a better widget or providing better service or slightly better. It's, it's just the value proposition on how to look at it. Okay, great. So um, I appreciate David restating this because I, I was having trouble reading what his question was. Uh, he's asking for your views on... Um, job seeking strategies, uh, and, and I would say also as they lead to uh, launching a business, can a new job, uh, a now job, the job you have now lead to experience and training to increase the breadth of your attractive capabilities and I, I think background for launching a business. And Richard, I think this is something you certainly can speak to leading the student innovation and entrepreneurship area. How important is it for people to have that breadth of experience behind them before they launch a new business? Do we look at jobs in terms of I'm learning something now that I'm going to take with me to launch later? Well, you know, uh, some people can create a business when they're 22, 23 years old. Um, all the data that we've seen demonstrates that having a broad experience 
and a knowledge of some dimension of your businesses leads to greater success. You're always going to have somebody at 22 that starts a business and all of a sudden they, it, the business becomes Facebook or Google or something like that. But for most people, um, you need experience and you need a breath and you, 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 you need to learn. I can't talk today. You need to learn how to find a compelling opportunity and then manage all of the aspects of going forward. Most people don't recognize that most high potential entrepreneurs start their business when they're 38 years old. That's like the average. That doesn't mean you can't when you're 25 or you're 28 or you're 60 for that matter. But people have a degree of experience and the experience statistically makes you more likely to be successful. If, if I were someone and I were entrepreneurial and I didn't have an idea, I would go and find out where I could learn a broad skill set and start networking with people to learn how the pieces fit together and how to bring together a team when I do find that idea. Um, there's no harm in waiting until you find something that's compelling and building your skills. And working for a big company gives you tools and working for a startup company will help you learn some skills that will really serve you well also. Um, I don't know, do you, Darren, do you have some comments on that? Yeah, no, I, I fully agree. I think uh, it, it's always best course of action to get your 10,000 hours of practice in. Um, you know, it, it, it is true that the more you do something, whether it's focused in your career or your industry, the better you'll be in your business. For myself, I started out at a telecom company with my co-op experience from RIT, which was awesome. I got my five quarters at the same company. Um, and because of that, I had a full deep dive, not in a starter position. I wasn't, I wasn't getting coffee, but I was in the network operations center troubleshooting and solving problems. That gave me the experience in the industry that I eventually started a company from. When we started the company, we weren't starting as newbies in the industry. People already knew who we were. They knew what we were about. And they knew that we kind of knew what we were talking about, right? We were adding a new spin to the, the, an older industry, but our credibility was there. And more importantly, our confidence. And the only way that you could truly gain confidence is with practice. You can't go play baseball for the first time in the major leagues and having never picked up a bat. But if you want to be a pro player, you need to have your practice. Yeah. There is no difference in anything in life, whether it's a career or even personal, uh, whether it's dating or, or becoming a CEO, you need to practice first. So I don't think it's a bad idea at all, especially if you want to start, start a corporate based organization where you actually work inside of a corporate environment or structure. All of the while keeping in the back of your mind that one day this is just practice for that big exit you're going to take to start your own business. And as you said, it's not it's not uncommon for you know Facebook, where where Mark Zuckerberg had no real corporate company experience, but yet he made something mega. But that's because it was the right place at the right time with the right mind, filling a need and a void. With and really, his practice was collegiate. He started off in a college where if he failed, he would have graduated and then gone to life. It's a little bit harder to do that. <laughs> if you graduated yeah. college and you're expected to be in life. And from the studies, I know that what Darren has just said about him working in telecom and then start finding an idea and then starting his own company, over 50% of the high potential businesses actually start like that. They're working in the field, they find a unique opportunity and they have the skills and the networks to bring it out and to start something new. So there's, there's, great benefit in working in a comp in a field for a company that you might find an opportunity and, and move forward with that on your own in the future. Terrific. Um, here's the next question. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna paraphrase this a little bit. So we're looking at uh, today's economic dip and what we are unsure of the economy is going to be in the next year to two years. Um, and the impact that that has had on uh, interpersonal contact related industries like tourism and wellness and so on. Um, and those have been so negatively impact, impacted and are trying to transition services to some kind of online personalized version. What kind of reforms of infrastructural amendments 
will be helpful in reviving in revival res respect to cost recovery. Let me say that again. What kind of reforms of infrastructural amendments will be helpful in revival with respect to cost recovery? Wow. I know. <laughs> I that, um, you know, it's interesting. I, I don't want to say anything about it, but in our summer programs, we have some of our um, our best and brightest students working with some companies right now that are service oriented, face to face type of interactions, and we're actually helping with some of that. Um, if I if I was forced to if if I was forced to give an answer that was two word words, I would say virtual reality, um, and something akin to that. But you're gonna, I am, I am somewhat certain that you're going to see the worst. Um, recession happened to those types of service industries that are face to face. And the real question is, is will this um, push us to an environment where the balance of face to face versus digital and virtual reality changes? I suspect the answer is yes. I just don't know the spectrum. So you're going to have a lot of business opportunities that are going to use digital software um, broadband to, to help people be more personal over the internet. And quite honestly, when you think about now versus even 10 years ago um, with Zoom, th this is pretty nice. I mean, this is, I mean, I don't feel massively, I'm not an online, I I'm not great at online teaching, but I feel really comfortable talking to the 150 people that are here right now. Yeah, and I, I think the important word for this is pivot. And unfortunately, we are going to see some industries uh, decimated if they don't pivot and haven't thought about pivot pivoting. Um, one of the most important things that a CEO has to has to understand and truly embrace is the worst case scenario yeah. at all times. And you know, it's sometimes lonely at the top because you're constantly walking around thinking about risk, risk, risk. You took a risk to start a business. You took a risk to put your life on hold and jump into entrepreneurship. That was a big leap, but not the biggest risk. The biggest risk then comes when you have lots of employees and expenses and bills and healthcare and families who depend on you. And now every day is a risk. Bringing on a new client, you would think that's a win, but that's a risk. Everything you do, you have to kind of look at your company in a holistic way saying, well, if this industry was to implode, how do I keep my business surviving? What's my pivot that we can all work with to then have another existence? There are many companies out there that started off making one product in the 1800s, and they no longer make that product anymore, right? If you look at Coca-Cola, the Coca part, right, is no longer in their business model. They were the, one of the world's first drug dealers. <laughs> it, it was legal, so cool, but they had to pivot. Their pivot was it became illegal. So what did they do? They made soda, and they, they took the ingredient out and look at that today. There are many examples like that, and I think especially with the travel industry, uh, it will bounce back, but only for those that make it through. There will be a ton of consolidation and or businesses that don't exist, but I I don't know. I'm sure everyone on this on this call wants to jump on a plane and go to some island somewhere. And if you have children, you want to send them to some island somewhere as soon as possible. Um, so, so travel will survive. Yeah. Well, and I think I, 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 there was an interesting thought as I was reading this question, which is even for not not just for startup businesses, for existing businesses, the business model change that you've got here because I know so many the digital content that they put out is the free enticing opportunity for somebody to then engage at a deeper level and now those businesses everything is digital and they're saying well I can't do everything for free how do I make a business out of this now but they've trained a customer mentality that says if it's digital it's free um Nothing in this world is free, right. so to speak. Um, one example from, from the gaming world is uh, one of the largest gaming games out there is a freemium game. But it's not free because if you want to be cool, you have to buy skins for your avatar, because just like clothes. 
and then you have to buy extra weapons and, and put your money in somehow to then grow the business. So there really is nothing for free. Now, starting off offering a free product, as you see with so many apps, is a great idea for a lot of those apps. But at some point, there is a pivot to revenue because at the end of the day, businesses are solely about revenue and profits. Even not-for-profits have to make money, right? It's, it's a different model, but there has to be some exchange of goods and services for profits. Um, but yeah, like I said, there's nothing that's free in that sense. Yep. Yeah, and, and uh, if, I could just, if I could just add one thing to that, particularly online, there's about a dozen clever ways you can make money without customers or consumers is a better word, without consumers recognizing that you're making money. So it might, have free, it might appear free to you, but it's not free. There's all sorts of data. There's all sorts of leads that are being sold. Um, it's one of the reasons why the consumers now sits down and worries about their privacy. Um, the reason they worry about that is because they're not paying for online goods and they found alternative ways to make a lot of money off of your data. Yeah. When was the last time, other than the business account of Facebook, when was the last time anyone on this call put a dollar into their, uh, their computer to use Facebook? It's free, but it's not. They're making money on the ads. They're making money on the data. They track you. Um, you know, so it, it's an example of what appears to be free isn't. You as the user of Facebook fully understand, and I hope you understand, everything you do is their property yeah, right? and, and their trends and their marketing to you. And you're OK with that because you're getting an equal benefit in your eyes. By the way, I'm going to throw in a, a, a free political announcement for RIT and its alumni network. We put out a lot of students that, uh, well, alums that work on this, and we have a couple alums that have created very large businesses actually figuring out clever ways to link together um, websites and um, and people that want to advertise to to fund these type of things. It's a it's a billion dollar business, and there's a lot of clever things, and not and they aren't mischievous in the sense that they're they're selling your data. It's it's a, it's a good business model to figure out how to do that. I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, interrupt. No, that that's fine. Um, here's a new question. Uh, isn't there more availability of capital today versus 2008 to 2013? Do you agree that the beginning of this current recession's economic fundamentals are better and able to get through the next few years, especially for startups? Um, I'm going to go and say sure. Uh, the reality is, is we're in a really tough uh, economic crisis. I think uh, VCs in the PE world is a little bit, uh, as Richard alluded earlier, is a little bit more uh, regimented on what they're willing to take a risk on. But there's always money. Your house is technically worth what someone is willing to pay for it. So if, if you do have that great idea and you can sell it and you put together a really good business plan, um, yeah, th there's money out there. Uh, even during the Great Depression, there was a lot of money out there, but you have to unlock it somehow. Um, so uh, I think just by uh, by pure economies of scale and monetary um, policy, there is more money today than there was uh, in theory in, uh, in 2008. But that doesn't mean that you're going to get the same valuation for your idea. I think today um, there's different ways of funding an organization but you're going to probably have to give up a little more equity for that great idea right now in this moment than you would have at, at another more healthy uh, uh, economy. I, I'm going to answer that in a slightly different way. Um, and what Darren said is, sure, you're, you're probably right. I would say that we're not going to know the answer to that for probably another year because we don't know how much capital is being given out and it can't be collected very quickly. Um, I suspect that it's down considerably as people have risk, but I suspect it will be better than it was in 2008 because of the nature of this crisis versus the nature of the financial crisis in 2008, which was really a financial crisis based on fairy dust bonds. Um, and so I suspect the answer will be, it's gonna be really hard in the traditional service industry but I think there'll be money outside of that, if, if that makes any sense at all. 
Yeah, and I think uh, there, there was another question up here that uh, asked you to shed some light on industries or domains that you think are likely to come up with uh, feasible or innovative businesses, whether they're continuous or disruptive. And I, I think it's a perspective that says this is an odd environment because it's not like there's a blanket pall over business. There are some businesses that are thriving in this environment, and then there's entire industries like tourism that have been hit so hard. So are you seeing any ones um, in your view that really have an opportunity in their industries right now? So, so you know, great businesses come from the toughest of times. This also allows for opportunity um, within certain industries. The healthcare industry, although it's being pounded, there are a lot of healthcare companies doing very well. If you made PPE four months ago, you were doing all right. You were you, you were running your mom and pop business and your revenues were consistent. And I would say uh, hockey stick to a plateau for quite a while. And now if, if you've done the right thing, you are one of the most valuable companies on the planet right now, mm -hmm. because, you know, forget about the, the monetary and the revenue aspect, but you are really in need. And that will have a lasting effect. I mean, if you make face masks, 3M right now is going to be making an overabundance of face masks to the point where we can't even stockpile enough of them for the next three to five years. That's just one example. Um, yeah, the travel industry isn't doing so well and it won't do so well for a while, but VR absolutely will, right? Uh, the gaming industry, it was doing very well and growing. It's going to double within the next year. There are lots of things that, that are getting that boost from, from this tough economic time versus, uh, versus any other time. But again, for every positive, there's going to be a negative. There's going to be an industry that just withers, you know, might not go away, but it's, gonna, it's certainly going to reel for a while. Think about the restructuring just in the first thing that, that Darren spoke about, telemedicine. People are going to be forced to do more tele telemedicine. Um, we now, when we meet with our doctors, just in my own house, we telemedicine with them. It's quicker, it's easier, and it provides 70 to 80% of the benefit of physically going there. Imagine how that's going to explode and how that's going to allow experts to be able to, to, to be housed somewhere that's cheaper for them. There's all sorts of these neat, neat opportunities. It's going to change everything. Um, here's something that my financial advisor told me, and I'll let you fo folks figure out. Um, she basically said to my family, um, actually, there, we, we have two different ones, but one of them said to our family, now is the time to invest in companies that make products or give services to young children because there's going to be a baby boom. Yep. Now, I don't know if that's going to be true. I suspect it will, but think about think about that. Anything that is going that this COVID pandemic environment has actually fostered is going to have a market. Yeah. And anything that relates to continual face-to-face -face mechanisms will probably take a while to recover, sure. if not a couple of years. Um, yeah. No, that's true. And, and food delivery businesses that didn't deliver three months ago. They're delivering now. Delivery services are way up. Anything that we do in the foreseeable future will most likely involve an at-home component, at-home haircuts, at-home deliveries of everything possible. You know, if, if we didn't have Amazon and delivery groceries, the, the outcome of what we're living in today would be far, far worse. There would have been bread lines. There would have been far worse effects but the fact that that there were industries set up that were able to adapt and pick up more of deliveries in this case they were able to survive and grow amazon is worth a lot more today than it was three months ago yeah. um, uber is worth a lot less today than it was three months ago although uber eats is surpassing what uber was because now deliveries of every one of your favorite restaurants is totally possible because of Uber Eats or DoorDash or, or companies that already had these platforms in place. You know, another field that is ripe for disruption, um, with all the students being sent home, um, and we'll, we'll take K through 12. Okay, most experiences, most 
at least all parents probably want to send their kids back. Okay. Yeah. Um, having, having said that, but I've just recently read a survey that said there is a minority of people who have thought that this is so enjoyable and so easy that the number of homeschoolers actually may triple over the next five years because they figured out that this is doable. That means that people that provide services for homeschooling families may go up astronomically or um, hybrid schools where they help homeschoolers and they provide socialization and, and larger um, infrastructure. So there's there's just a lot that's emerging right now. This is yeah. a, a great time for innovation and ideas. Yeah, I mean, I for one can't wait to send my kids to school again. Um, it's, it's very difficult being a teacher. Uh, especially of young children. But yes, there are some uh, parents that really have a knack for it and they're enjoying that closeness. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, I think homeschooling will absolutely stick for, for quite a bit of time, for sure. There's many advantages to homeschooling. There's obvious disadvantages as well uh, from a social standpoint. Um, colleges will have a huge opportunity in front of them. Uh, one of my clients uh, from my telecom company made online programs for colleges. Uh, they made the platform, they, they brought it to the college and allowed for MBA programs and, and, and to extend the reach. Today, most colleges that didn't have a telecommuting or a mobility strategy were limited to the amount of seats and dorms. But now they could extend indefinitely, right? As a teacher, you need to pivot to be able to teach a class online, but that one class recorded or live can now extend to an unlimited amount of, of minds which is as a, a college as a business that allows the college to now expand past whatever RIT is probably what 16,000 uh, on, on school uh, housing, mm -hmm. you can get to 32,000 now. Yeah. Um, so there is opportunity there. There's opportunity to keep the lights on. Those colleges, and you've seen it in the news recently, there are a few colleges that they didn't have a distance learning program. They couldn't figure it out fast enough because they weren't thinking of the risk and unfortunately, some colleges are actually closing their doors because of this. Yep, that's right. And uh, I, I'm going to take an opportunity to put a little plug in because uh, later, early next month, we have Therese Hanneken from RIT's <laughs> online learning program um, and, and the RITx program. And she's going to be talking about exactly that, which is the the innovation, the disruption, and the uh, long-term view of what online learning is bringing to a higher ed environment. Okay, what is the, this is a big question. What is the best way to access angel investment income? What is the minimum revenue threshold to make it worthwhile for an angel to consider a business idea? Uh, with one consult, Consulting, we are a one consulting startup similar to the old 800 origination game at ACC and Paytech. I think this is another guy you know. No, uh, I, except, I, it doesn't ring a bell actually. So. Uh, except a completely different industry. Going well, used all our own money, recession proof, should do 650K this year in their third year. We're starting another new business, could do it on their own, but if I had investment income, we could ramp it up faster. So, so angel investing and minimum thresholds. So, all right, so when I think angel investor, I think someone that is near and dear to you, close family, friend, uh, maybe a family or friend around, it's, it's challenging to get somebody to literally give you money with few strings attached. And they're not asking for a lot of equity of your company. Um, you know, you're basically raising debt or minimal amounts of capital. Um, when we started our business, I had an angel investor, um, 2008, tough times. I was eating Hot Pockets. I needed to make sure that I could stay alive because otherwise there would be no company. Um, we asked for $100,000 and it was a person that I knew for many years in the telecom industry. Uh, and within two or three meetings of explaining my business plan, showing the plan, um, we got a check. And we ended up repaying that within five years. Um, so it's the rule of thumb when you ask for money is ask for more than you need because you're going to use it and you don't want to continuously run rounds of funding. But if you're going out for an angel round, I would keep it to, to people that you are close with, that know your backgrounds, you have proven yourself to them in some extent. 
um, because otherwise you're going to have to spend too much time focusing on making the investor happy versus running your business. And the last thing you want to do is, is have to focus on making investors happy because it's hard to do that. They want to have a lot of conversations. Um, as far as your revenues go, $650,000, that's, you know, pat yourself on the back. That is great. Um, you know, you should be proud of that inside of three years. That's awesome. But it's really, you have to forecast how much you need. But when it comes to Angel, I, I wouldn't ask for too much, but I would ask for, you know, enough. And uh, there are sites like angel.co where you can post your business and, and uh, things about you where you could get uh, angel investors that uh, or you know, small amounts of investments from people that you do, don't know. So Darren, I, I want to note that uh, the eating all those hot pockets in 2008 obviously didn't didn't do you any harm. So um, yeah, but- no, I can thank my parents for that. Um, but no, it, it's it's true. Those who know me know the story well. Uh, it was uh, six pocket boxes of lean pockets for ten dollars at my uh, grocery store across the street. Um, I ate one a night for about two years. That oh. was that's how I lived, and you know there are risks. To me, growing a business and starving, or at least mildly starving, was the risk I was willing to take. And if you're not willing to take that risk, you know you can't get to the reward. Um, I want to ask. Uh, uh, I want to ask Lydia a question. What you? The question that you asked us earlier about angel investing, I didn't really understand because the terms you used made it seem as if the person wanted to be an angel investor because he talked about angel investor income. So I wasn't sure if he was trying to get information about getting angel investment or if he wanted to be an angel investor and get revenue from that. It was unclear to me from what you've said. If you're, if you're I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I believe it that that he is asking about securing angel investing because he's talking about possibly starting another new business that he could do on his own while he's got this one running, but he's looking for some kind of investment uh, in order to ramp up a little more quickly. Okay. Yeah, that's how I interpreted it as well. Yeah, I just wasn't sure because of the words. Um, in, in one sense, the easiest place for you to get money is the close place, the, the place where it's family and friends. Um, they're a little bit more forgiving. You still have to have a formal way of giving it back. But what we've seen over the last 10 years with the huge number of individuals coming in being angel investors is they've professionalized. What they've done is they, they used to be just individuals that would look at this and they would typically invest in what they knew and what they were good at. Now what you have is you have bands of angels getting together and using the same processes as venture capitalists. So um, if you're just looking at um, a band of angels here in Rochester, almost every single um, small and medium marketplace now has a band of angels and they're, they come together and you have someone that runs it. In Rochester, it's called RAN, Rochester Angel Network. Um, I can link you in with the people there and you can go ahead and present that they have a, they have a committee for screening and they'll take information to see if you can be screened. And if you then get, go through the screening, they'll bring you to the larger group and find out if people are interested, but you can, you can get substantial amounts of money that way. And and Rochester has done as many cities have a, a really good job at professionalizing that and helping early, um, early stage investors get involved in that. Um, Okay. Um, Question on business protection insurance. This is coming from an aspiring entrepreneur. How do you feel about business protection insurance, um, especially where COVID-like viruses and these kind of health environments are not covered in their policy? How would a business or a sole business owner protect themselves from this kind of unexpected event? Um. So I personally don't know of insurance companies that are covering COVID related, um, but I would look at covering just or or obtaining just the right amount of insurance, especially if you're in a startup mode, every dollar can only be spent once. I would kind of skip that um, knowing that as a business owner, the pivots you can do are your insurance. You've heard the term um, furlough. Uh, employees. Well, that's unfortunate, but you have to sometimes be able to uh, use certain things like layoffs or structured layoffs at your disposal. Um, I don't know many companies that would cover um, 
and I believe this would be considered a force majeure event or an act of God, um, because there's just too many of those. Uh, but you know, my my honest advice was would be to get health care insurance. Uh, if you're starting out with a board, eventually get your board of directors or your directors and officers insurance, your your executive and officers insurance as time progresses. But I wouldn't go too crazy with spending a lot of money on insurance when you're a startup, especially if you have no assets. The money, all of the money needs to go back into the business to support your core product, uh, to support you so you can continue to live on another day and not supporting the insurance companies. I apologize if there's any insurance brokers on the call, um, <laughs> but I'm sure they would appreciate as well. They, they want a client that's gonna have staying power. So uh, they want you to be you know, more advanced in your, in your organization to buy insurance. Yeah. Um, the only thing I wanna um, mention here is that uh, your lawyer, startup lawyers are gonna have strong contact with business insurance agents. And there's norms like for, for you to get into the uh, RIT Venture Creations Incubator, you need to have insurance. There's going to be norms for the type of industry you're, you're in and acts of God. And when I say acts of God, that's a that's a term that's not about God. That's that's, that's a term. Acts of God typically aren't covered by this, but they would bankrupt everybody. And so the government would, would surely intervene if it's going to put out all the small businesses. So I would go to your, your, your small business lawyer, talk to a business insurance agent and find out what is standard because you don't want to bankrupt yourself. Nobody's going to start businesses if, if, the, if the cost of starting a business is tripled with insurance. It just isn't going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, last question. I'm going to sort of combine these two. The, the question started with uh, the state of um, government supported entrepreneurial zones like New York Startup New York program, um, those types of programs, and whether you should look at industries in that area. But then uh, we would add into that, um, and this is, I think, right up your, uh, your direction, Richard, is does RIT offer a think tank or some way to run ideas by a mentor or advisor to see if they have legs? Um, do you need to take a course or go for another degree to get into that with RIT? Um, he works as a SCORE mentor, but he'd like to go over ideas with more experienced entrepreneurs if possible. Well, R RIT has, first of all, let me address the, the New York State programs. If someone has a, a, an interest in how RIT works with these, these New York State programs, send me an email directly and I'll link you in with the, with the Venture Creations Incubator, which actually is the one that administers them. I typically work with early stage businesses that are mostly student or faculty related. And as they begin to start up the business, we transition them over to Venture Creations Incubator. So they look at the, they look more at the, the early stage funding than we do. Um, but so if you want to come and brainstorm with us, RIT doesn't offer a brainstorming session. What we do offer for non-students is we have the Venture Creations Incubator that will, that you can go in and talk to them about your idea and see where you are. Um, if RIT doesn't offer it, there are a variety of, of training options within the community. The TENS program is there and we can link you in with those because what RIT doesn't offer and oftentimes there are public services, we can uh, link you in with some public organization or some association that can give you training. Um, but we do have a very, an excellent, very successful high-tech incubator, and they're always looking for opportunities to help the RIT community start their businesses and work with them as a community, but they, they don't do the early, early stage things. Okay. Well, we want to thank uh, Darren and Richard for a, a pretty interesting and pretty timely discussion. We, we are at the end of our time here, but if there are additional questions, we can email, we can have you email those to RIT alum at rit.edu and we'll direct your questions to our two presenters. Uh, and again, all of our audience members will receive an email from us with a link to today's webinar recording. Um, please visit rit.edu slash alumni slash tigers dash staying dash home for a listing of our upcoming virtual events. We have several virtual events running each week and we want to include you in as many of these as possible. 
Again, Richard and Darren, thank you both so much for your insights into this topic. I think everyone um, walked away with at least, at least a couple actionable ideas that they can, uh, can put forward. So uh, for our audience, thank you for joining us today. And please do exit this webinar by just closing your browser window. And please let us know what you thought of the webinar through a brief survey that you are going to receive via email. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful week and please stay healthy.